The title of my message is Build a Godly Home. So if you're taking notes, uh, you can write that down, Build a Godly Home. And, uh, you know, it's so amazing, you know, we have, before I go into that, you know, it's so important that we have these services, I just want to say, that we have our services where our children are in the service uh, with us, learning how to be in a church atmosphere, not just in a Sunday atmosphere, but really learning alongside us to learn how to, to, to see how mom and dad do church. It's a, such a powerful learning example uh, as we do that. And so we have these every month that we have five weeks in a month. Um, and so we try to do this in such a way that we really prioritize family in the church. And, and we don't just do that because we want to uh, uh, be just a family church, but really God is all about family. I mean, his whole purpose in creating man was to have family. And so it's important that every now and then we always be reminded of this truth. And we always be reminded of what a godly home looks like. What, uh, what family should be like. And, and we, we're going to dive into scripture to be able to determine that today. Amen? Amen. So uh, if I were to ask you, what does a godly home look like? Well, for some of us here, we didn't grow up in godly homes. So we don't even have the slightest clue. We, we, we probably wouldn't be able to come up with much um, and then for those of us who grew up in a godly home, uh, we might say things like, uh, have family dinners together, you know, and, or we might say things like, spare the rod, spoil the child, right? <laughs> we have these different sayings in, in Christian homes, Christian, Christianese things that we say that, that uh, kind of help us to define what a Christian home looks like. And, and all of these things, have, they have truth. And there's probably about a million different things that we can come up with, tips and, and tricks to be godly parents and to build a godly home. And, and while those are really important, I want to try and narrow down today something that, that, that regardless of your tradition, regardless of your background, regardless of how you grew up, there's something that you can leave with that will be rem a reminding aspect for those of you who are, have been Christian, but for those of you who don't have that concept of a godly home, that you can have something to go home with and remember, ah, uh, yes, this is, this is how I can structure my home. Every family tradition might look differently, but here is what I can do to foster a healthy, godly family. And so the way I'm going to do that today is I want to I want to liken a godly home to building an actual home. I want to take and illustrate an idea as we are looking at our, 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 our spiritual atmosphere of our homes that we look at the physical, uh, phys physical attributes of an actual home. So if you're taking notes, if you're taking notes, you can write down, every house needs a foundation. Every house needs a foundation. And for us as Christians, and most of you know where I'm going with this, is that Christ is our firm foundation, right? Matthew 7, 24 through 27. This, this idea is, is, this concept is, is, is something that, that we should all uh, already be familiar with at some point in your Christian walk. You realize that Christ has to be the center of everything. And we all know this, it's, a, it's an elementary thought, so to speak, in Christianity, but how many of us can actually say in our homes that, there, that, that it, we actually live this out in our family, that, that Christ really is the foundation? Now, we might grow in and around church, and our kids come to church, but reality is, is our kids are only at church two hours out of the whole entire week. And the rest of the time, they're either at school, which is six hours a day, or they're at home. And so there's a lot more time that when we think we're building Christ as a foundation in our home just because we come to church, that doesn't actually mean that the foundation is being laid. You hear me? Are we awake this morning? You see, when we are talking about prioritizing Christ in the home, how much of it is learned from you and how much is it actually learned from the pastors or the, teach, the Sunday school teachers? See, because the, the reality is, is this. Sunday school teachers and pastors, they'll teach your kids about Christ, but it's up to you to teach your kids to live like Christ. 
Oh, come on, somebody. That's, that's preachable right there. <laughs> it's up to you to determine how, how they live like Christ. We need to ask ourselves the question. Some of us, you know, you know, you know, we need to realize and ask ourselves the question, how much in our home, in our routines, in our daily life, is Christ being the central aspect? How are we, how are we practically doing that at our home? You know, how are we practically teaching our kids how to make Christ the center? You know, uh, it, it, you know as the kids say, when, uh, when something hits different, they say that word, it hits different. When you teach your kids as compared to when the school teacher teaches their kids or when the pastor teaches their kids, it hits different. Amen. Somebody, one of the, some of the kids around here say, tell your, say, tell your parents, it hits different. It hits different. It hits different in our hearts when, when kids get to see mom and dad actually live out the lifestyle of Christ. When they actually get to see mom and dad make Christ the, the, the priority in the home. Think about the routines that you have in your life. Because as some, of, as some of you might be thinking as I'm saying this, that you're thinking about, well, man, I'm working two jobs, maybe three jobs. I just, and, and when I come home, my kids, I, ta- I take them home from daycare. I'm exhausted. Like, the last thing I want to do is sit down and, hey, hey, kids, let's talk about Christ, right? Most of our kids, you know, especially if they're young, they're like, ah, you know, all over the place, and it's wild, right? So how do we really do that? How do we, how do we make Christ the center when we've really just begun so tired, when, we are, when we're not in the place where we want to, like, sit down and let me teach you something? Well, I want to read to you Colossians 3.17. It says this, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. As parents, we need to learn how to make life moments teaching moments. We need to learn, and the goal in our lives should not be to try to find time to talk about Jesus as much as it should be the goal to integrate Jesus into everything that we do. What would happen, if, and let's just get real for a moment, what, let's, what would happen if your kids began to see you pray every morning? What would happen if your kids saw you reading your Bible, that instead of you coming home and binging on Netflix, kids saw you getting into the Word, reading the Word? Because these are the things that teach our children. Most of the things, and you know, I, I have not to, uh, to, to put my, my title out there, but I have a, a teaching degree. And uh, one of the things that we learn in education and psychology is that even in, even in the secular world, they know that you, a, a, t- a parent is the most important person in the teaching of a child. Because it's not about necessarily learning all of this information and facts. It's about knowing what to do with the facts. Knowledge is a dime a dozen. Knowledge is a dime a dozen. But knowing how to use that knowledge and knowing that not all knowledge is created equal, that comes from us as parents. This is where we can really train our children. And how we train our children is by the way that we live our lives. It's by the example that we set. It's through our routines. And you know what I think is interesting? What would happen? What would happen is if we had these routines in our lives that, 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 that showed Christ in every aspect. For some of you, that might look at first like praying at every meal. For some of you, it might look like actually developing a prayer life. For some of us, it may look like instead of putting on TV, we spend time and we actually sit around the table and play games together. Because in that moment, you're showing your kids that, hey, they matter. There's attention. There's present. I'm being present in that moment. And, and sometimes these different things, all of these good attributes that we can learn as, uh, uh, and, and tips along the way, these are all great. But at the, at the core of it, of it all comes from the mentality of I'm going to make Christ the foundation. He's going to be in every aspect of our house, right? The foundation touches every single room. It's not just, it's not just um, you know, uh, uh, on one room and the other room doesn't have foundation. The whole entire house is touched by the foundation, and it's being held up by the foundation. It doesn't matter, and, and, and let me say it this way too. As you begin to develop routines, it will create a culture in your home. 
it will create a culture in your home. And culture is what changes kids. That's why culture of the world is working so hard to change culture, right? Because they know that culture changes kids. What culture is in your home? What culture are you developing in your household to be able to, to spark conversations? Because sometimes I think you would be surprised as how much times that we say, oh, we don't have time to teach our kids. But when we begin to develop a culture in our home, routines in our home, how all of a sudden Christ becomes the center of our conversation. Because kids will say, well, mom, wh why do you pray? Dad, why do you read your Bible? Oh, well, let me tell you right? And these, these conversations begin to come up. Then the kids begin to see us serving in church, and they begin to see us active in the church, and, and, and active in, in living it, not just, uh, uh, you know, happy and, and, and just go lucky on Sunday morning, and then throughout the week, we're living like hell, right? It's when they see that consistency that they realize Christ actually does matter, and then they'll begin to develop their own culture, it's funny because I noticed this in my own daughter, uh, and I, I have this video. I think I shared it with our, um, our uh, preachers and demon slayers that we have, a video of my daughter. Uh, one day, we were just sitting on the couch and just playing with her toys and all this stuff, and then she starts, like, going, like this, like she's praying in tongues. And I just, I just got the biggest kick out of it. I thought it was so funny. I'm like, where did she learn that? And then not to, to put anything on myself, but I'm like, you know what? That's a proud parent moment. Because she always sees me walking around the house going, oh, she bataraki, you know, just praying in tongues and even under my breath. Because I, I, I try to live a lifestyle of that. I try to live an example of that. And it's funny because kids pick up on everything you do. And so uh, it's a really cute video, and I don't have it here to share with you, but just to remind us that everything we do, what culture are we creating in our home? Are we building a foundation of Christ through the actions, through the routines, for the disciplines that we develop? Amen? Point number two, not only does a house have to have a foundation, but there needs to be a frame of the house, right? There needs to be a framework that actually de de develops the parameters of the home, right? Well, for us as Christians, love and honor are our framework. They define the parameters of each and every single room of the home, every aspect of the home. The house is developed on a sturdy frame. In fact, every house that stands tall, uh, every house stands tall on the frame in which it's built. Each, each framed wall provides structure for the house, right? The structure of the home actually comes from the frame that's built. So when we begin to recognize this and put this analogy into our, our Christian home, love and honor need to be our framework. It's what brings structure in our home. Oftentimes we're so quick to put rules and regulations and we miss the actual framework for the rules and the regulations. And that framework should be love and honor. I want to read to you this. And I just want to say this too. The more developed the frame is, the sta more stable the house is. So the more that you develop love and honor in the home, the more stable your household will be, right? Let me read to you 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter on love, right? Verses 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not envious. Love does not brag. It's not puffed up. It's not rude. It's not self-serving. It's not easily angered or resentful. It's not glad about injustice, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Amen. Now, imagine for a moment in our home, if we allowed love to be that framework, it should be really the basis of how everything in our family functions. It should be the, the, the parameters in which we treat and see each other in our home. Like I said, as we build a strong frame, we get security and stability. And oftentimes when love and honor in the home is, is, is thoroughly developed, there's a sense of security there's a sense of stability in the home that allows kids, allows the family members, not just the kids, but this goes for the mom and the dad. When love and honor are the lens in which we see, it's the parameter in which we build. Now, 
our homes allow each and every person to function the way that we're God-given, the God-given way that we're supposed to function. We begin to see that in my child, you know, I, I look at my children and uh, even now I try to practice this in my home where I begin to even honor them <laughs> at their baby age of who they are. And the way I honor them now, it's not that I'm like, I honor you like this. I'm not weird about it. But one of the things that I do is I speak life into them, even when they don't understand it. And I pray over them. And if my wife was here, she's with the kids right now. She's getting ready with them right now. But she would tell you that every single night before bed, I pray over them. And I declare over my daughter that she is a prophetess, that she is a worship leader. I declare over her that she's going to be a bold uh, trumpet, a loud a trumpet for those who are around her. And she's going to walk in justice. And for my son, I declare over him that he's a pastor, that he's a shepherd. And I declare over him, over my children, already what they're going to be. And I, I pray it over them every night. And as they grow up, my plan is to continue to honor them in that, that way. Because when I, allow my, when I allow the framework of how I parent to be love and honor, what happens? My children will then flourish. You, their uniqueness will come out. It will, it will be a place where they can thrive. It will be a place where all the God-given things will begin to develop and bear fruit. So as I go in my home and I develop this framework and I begin to set the stage of what that framework will be like, my children will then follow suit. And, you know, I want to even say to us parents sometimes because when we talk about honor, first thing we say, honor your father and your mother. And this is absolutely true. But I want to say to parents, don't be afraid to be the one that initiates honor. Don't be afraid to be the one that initiates honor. Look at Jesus. What is honor in the first place? Honor is to highly value or to, to highly esteem. Look what Jesus did to us. We were dishonorable in all the things that we, we had done. And yet Jesus so highly valued and honored us that he was willing to die for us. He honored us in that manner. And as a response, we honored back. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us, right? Right? So don't be afraid as a parent to be the one to initiate honor in the home. You know, oftentimes we say that, you know, you know that honor, as parents, we think in ourselves that honor should be something that is just, is given to us. But honor is really earned in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, honor is earned. And we have to be the ones to, to be an example of that to our children. Because as we do that, our children will learn to honor us back. Even, even in, the, in the chapter of Ephesians, right, where, where we see the structure of the home being developed, and we, and we see Paul talking about how uh, wives should submit to their husbands, and we see that children should honor their parents and all of these things. What is the thing that the authority of the home has to do? The authority of the home, the father, has to be a priest. Oftentimes we think he's the Lord over the home, but no, Christ is the Lord over the home. The, hu the husband is the priest. What does the priest do? The priest intercedes. The priest is the one that, that begins to lay down the sacrifices before the Lord on behalf of his household. What sacrifices are we holding as parents over our household? What priestly duties are we holding over our household in order to instill honor, in order to show love to our children? Because it will be the very thing that allows us to, to, to make, make our children rise up in the way of God, to rise up in their God-given destiny. And I just want to say too that Jesus wasn't, his authority was never threatened by him honoring and sacrificing. In fact, his authority was established by his sacrifice. As parents, we have to understand that when, when we choose to honor our children, and I still know this sounds funny because usually it's children honor your parents, but, but it first starts with us. When we choose to honor our children, our authority becomes established with them. It really becomes like, wow, my parents aren't just throwing rules at me. My parents really care about me. And out of that place of love and, and nurturing, boom, honor comes. It's a byproduct. Some of us, um, sorry guys, they get a little warm up here, these lights. I also want to say this one thing before we move on to our next point, is that when love and honor are a framework, healthy, healthy and appropriate forms of discipline also become tools to, to raise our children. 
oftentimes, you know, we see that in our society today, um, parents are afraid of disciplining their children. It's either two things. You're either absolutely afraid of it or you love disciplining your children way too much. You know, it's two extremes. But oftentimes those of us who are afraid to discipline our children is because we see discipline as an act of anger. And that was how we were taught, that discipline is an act of anger. But I want to read to you Proverbs 3.12. It says this, For the Lord disciplined those he loves, just as a father disciplines the son whom he delights. Discipline is actually an act of love. And so when you begin to realize this as a framework, even when, when, when love and honor become the framework of your discipline, you discipline differently. You don't just act out of anger. There will definitely be consequences for actions, right? I'm not saying to get soft or to water down uh, uh, the, the standards in our home, but it will be the difference of your, your child doing something and it angers you so much and out of your anger, you grab the belt and you just, wah, wah, you know, and just lash out on your child. What would happen though if in, a, in an atmosphere of love and honor, we sit down with our children calmly we talk them through what they did wrong. And at the end, we still bring the rod of discipline. <laughs> what happens is there's a framework now. Children don't just see that, your par- that the parent is beating them senselessly, <laughs> right? Children begin to see, wow, I, I overstepped. I crossed the boundaries of our family culture. I actually tran- I trespassed our family line. I stepped out of honor and love. And for that, there are consequences. Children begin to see it differently. It develops the framework in which we can discipline our children effectively that don't leave them more rebellious, right? Because sometimes we can beat our children. It's like, man, this kid is stubborn, right? But that can be, that can be something that, that if we develop a framework of love, it will change even the, the effectiveness of our discipline. And I also believe that if we can develop love and honor in our home, then there's gonna be less acting out. There's gonna be less rebellion and less misunderstandings because everything that we do in the home is framed by love, framed by honor. And so it, it, children don't, when children got a good thing going on, even at their young age, children recognize, hey, I got a good thing going. I feel loved. They don't, wanna, they don't want to ruin that. They don't want to destroy that. But if they feel like, well, it's hopeless anyways, and, and, and this is true, and I, you might think, well, kids don't think that deeply. Um, there was a young, a young kid that um, uh, within our family, my personal family, who his parents, uh, through a lot of bad situations in life, uh, really did not take care of him well. And at 10 years old, he thought like a 40-year-old man. I kid you not. Uh, he had seen things. He had been around things that really just tainted his view of authority. And oftentimes, anytime you would try to give him any sort of like correction or try to build structure for him, structure in the sense of rules was an invitation to break them. But you know what helped guide him and change his heart was a structure of love and honor because he didn't know what to do with that. Because the rules, he knows if I just, if I just break them, then the rejection I've already felt in my life I'm going to prove it. So if I can get rejected, if I can be the cause of my rejection, then I don't have to feel the pain of rejection. At 10 years old, he was very aware of this. But in our home, he was with us for a short amount of time. But when he was with us, we began to love him, even when he did wrong. And he, it's like, cannot compute, brain can't work, you know. These people still like me, even though I bite, I bite them and I beat them and I hurt them. And, 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 and he couldn't handle it. He couldn't recognize what was happening to him. But something was changing on the inside because the framework was love, not, not rules, not regulation. And please hear me out. I'm not saying that rules and regulation are bad. We need those in our home. But, but let, fr- let the framework be love. Point number three. We must build our house with windows of vision. Windows of vision. Windows allow you to see outside of the house. Um, This speaks of greater purpose than just ourselves. As a family, we're created with a God-given purpose, a mission-minded aspect. As as believers, we're to win souls and make disciples. Our household needs to have windows of vision in our home that when when we are structuring our house, children need to know 
that the most important thing is not getting the, the highest paying job or going to school and get an education. Well, those are absolutely important, but the framework in which, in which they do it should be, I'm going to be a blessing into this world. My life, I, I am blessed to be a blessing. Everything that's in my home, God's prepared me. God has set me in my loving, godly home so that I could go and be the proof to my generation that God is real. That family unit is something to be honored and loved. And it should be something that I wanna, I wanna share with the world. When we do that, our children have a sense of vision that the, the, the rules and even the things in our home, they have purpose. They have context. It's not just because mom and dad live this way that we do it, but they see the bigger picture. They see the greater reason of why we do it. We need to not be afraid to teach our children to be mission-minded, even when they're five, six years old. Because in the school, they're already being taught to be mission-minded as well, just for the wrong mission. So what are we doing? Ask ourselves and our families, what are we doing to bring vision? Proverbs, Proverbs 29, 18 says, when there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but the one who keeps the law, blessed is he. You know, this is the, the truth. When we, when we have no vision, when we have no prophetic vision, when we have no vision leading us and guiding us forward, we oftentimes cast off any restraints, any things that we would develop in our lives because there's no purpose for them. And so we need to really develop that for our families, for our homes, that our children grow up and have vision. What vision and purpose are you instilling in your home? And does that vision and purpose point towards Christ? Does it point towards winning souls and making disciples? Let's begin to build windows of vision in our home, amen? Point number four, we must decorate our house with joy. Decorate our house with joy. Now, my, my wife, she loves to decorate the home because she feels that it makes the house into a home, right? Decorations allow us to see the, 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 the home is beautiful. And when we have joy in our family, it allows us to see the beauty in our family, right? Because joy is the thing in our family that, that can get us through the hard times, right? Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is our strength, it gets us through the, even the experiences when our family, because, you know, the rain falls on the good and the evil. Not everything's going to go perfect, but the joy of the Lord in the home will allow us to make our family make it through the end, right? Joy also is a healing agent. It's a healing agent. Proverbs 17.22 says, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. When we develop joy in our home, when we decorate our house with joy, we find opportunities to allow our household to have fun. That it's not just about the rules, but we have fun in our home. What happens is our children realize, hey, this whole Christian lifestyle thing is actually fun doing. I don't, like, mind doing it, <laughs> you know? And I think sometimes our children grow up thinking, man, it's just rules, regulations, and it's just all of these different things. I got to pray. I got to read my Bible. I don't even like to read. But when we begin to show our children, hey, the Christian life is actually really enjoyable, they'll not really want to leave it, right? Amen. Amen. And my last point is this. Grace and mercy are the roof that covers our home. Grace and mercy are the roof that covers our home. Now, some of us may be wondering, why is grace and mercy the roof? Shouldn't it be like more somewhere in the middle of everything that we do? But the reason why I, I, I'm calling it the, the roof is because all of us make mistakes. In fact, we all sin and sometimes can be just downright mean and in the wrong. Every family has its rainy days. And the reality is that rainy days are an inevitable. But grace and mercy provide a covering so that failures and shortcomings don't cause permanent damage. You know, see, because there's a difference when it rains on your house and when it rains in your house. When it rains in your house, now you got to deal with flood damage. you got to deal with all the inner aspects of what's beneath the surface, right? Because when, when there's pain and that's inflicted, it's usually not just on the surface level. It's beneath the floorboards. you got to really get in, in under there. And when we have grace and mercy, it allows there to be a covering that it doesn't just go, it just goes on the house, not in the house. Grace and mercy stop permanent damage from happening. Grace and mercy allow us to restore family members who've gone astray. And it creates an environment that they desire to be repentant. 
you know, let me go a little bit deeper in this thought too, is that, and I know my time is almost up, but mercy is not giving us what, mercy is not giving us what we, what we, let me try that again. Mercy is giving us what we don't deserve, right? Jesus did that to us. He exemplified mercy. We deserved punishment, but instead of punishing us, he punished Jesus, right? We didn't get what we deserved. But uh, grace goes even a step further, and grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Not only did he spare us from the wrath that we should have gotten, but he also gave us what we definitely should have not gotten, which is restoration, which was bringing us back into a right standing with him. What would happen in our homes if we practice grace and mercy to cover our homes? That not only when our kids mess up, or other family members, it's not just kids, other family members, if we practice not just mercy, not just saying, hey, I forgive you for what you did, but also I'm going to treat you as if it didn't happen. We're going to let bygones be bygones, and we're going to go back into the family unit that we are. And, you know, this brings total transformation. I understand that there's consequences for our actions, but I think if, you know, there's times if, if our children are truly repentant and not just trying to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, so that yet you don't punish them, right? But if they're truly repentant in their heart and they come to us and they, they confess something, I, I, I truly believe that this is not a time to discipline them. They shouldn't be punished for actually telling the truth. When we are able to have them come and they, they're truly in a repentant heart, and you know, you'd be the judge of that as a parent, but they're truly repentant in their heart, use it as a moment to say, I, I love you, I forgive you, and, and you are still accepted in this family. You're still loved. My heart doesn't change towards you. I really do believe it's going to make a difference. I believe it's going to have a lasting impact. Imagine the levels of honesty and transparency that will come as a byproduct of the moments that we show mercy. Because then our children begin to realize, I can, I can be open and honest about things that I'm struggling with or things that I'm doing. And I can, who, who would you rather them tell? Their friends or you? Right? Hopefully it would be us. You know, and can we as parents show mercy and grace, even when things that don't seem right? I want to give an example of this before, we, before I end here. Um, we had this student in internship about two years ago. And uh, he was a young kid. He was maybe 14, 15, but he was a trouble child. He might have been 16, I don't know. But he was a trouble child. He was actually a PK, a pastor's kid. And he had gone from internship to internship to internship. He had caused a lot of problems and headaches for this, this pastoral family. And, and they just didn't know what to do with him. I mean, I mean, even other internships, they, they said, hey, we're going to send you to Hungry Gen because maybe they can help. <laughs> you know, and... And not to say anything about Hungry Gen, even though I love us as a, as a ministry. But really, you know, he came in here very rebellious, didn't want anything to do with the program. He was sleeping during classes, not only sleeping during classes, but causing problems with the girls, flirting with them. And even the, and we don't really allow that at all. We don't, we don't allow actually at all <laughs> in our program. But, but he's just he's definitely out overstepping boundaries and not only that, and I'll, I'll keep it PG for uh, the, the audience that we have here with children, but he was doing other things uh, back at the house that other kids were telling me about. He had uh, certain um, items that allowed him to uh, change his state of mind, uh, if, you, if you catch my drift. And so it, he, he was doing these different things, um, partaking in these different substances, and he was doing it while he's in internship. And everybody came coming up to me saying, Bryson, you got to do something. You got you to lay down the law. You got to put him in his place. He needs to know that this is not okay. But I knew that he had already been told time and time again, don't do this. I know he knew what was right and wrong, but his heart was not what was right. And so instead of coming out with him trying to change his behavior, one of the things I did is, he knew. I took, I took all of these um, items out of his bedroom while he was in class. I took all of these items. And so he knew at that point, somebody knows 
what I'm up to. He knows that these items are gone, so somebody has told on me. Somebody's snitched. It's a matter of time until the hammer gets laid down, right? And so I noticed this thing of behavior about him every time he was around me because he knew that I knew, and I knew that he knew that I knew. (laughs) And we're looking at each other, and all I did was ever come up to him, give him hugs, say, hey, man, I love you, bro. I love you. And, uh, And just we went throughout our week, continued like that, and I could see he just was weird around me, not sure what, what to do, like, what's going on here? And I even instructed the other kids. Every time a kid came up to me and said, he's doing these things, I said, love him. Love him. Show him that he's still lovable. And what's interesting is now the whole class, recognizing what he's doing, just showing him love, he's, like, not even sure what to do with himself, So he begins to continue to act out because he thinks maybe if I act out bad enough, these guys, I'm going to break them. But instead, we kept our cool. We kept loving him and showing him mercy and treating him as if he's not the black sheep of the group. And what's interesting is one one group, one of our uh, home group nights that we had, randomly, we're all talking, we're having fun, and we're conversating. and, And then he gets up and says, hey, everybody, 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 I need, sit down, I need to tell you something. Now, first of all, he's not the kid to come up and and try and and, and guide the group. He's the quiet one in the back. So the fact that he's telling us to all sit down, all of us are like, okay. So we go and we sit down. And he comes up and he says, for the last three weeks, I've been doing this, 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 this. He spared no detail of all of the things that he was doing, beginning to confess his sins. He began, to, he began to say, I treated every single one of you so horribly. I disrespected you as the teacher, Bryson. I disrespected the program. I did all of these different things, coming in such a repentant heart. And one of the things he said was that, and none of you changed your view about me. And he's like, I didn't know what to do at first. He's like, but this is the first time I've ever felt God's love. This is the first time I ever realized that God loved me. I grew up in a Christian home. But this is when I realized God loved me. And he began to break down in tears. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior that night. And it wasn't just hype. Things actually began to change in his life. Even to the point where Within a week's time, he was calling his mom and dad and asking for forgiveness, for treating them wrong. He began to change his attitude, his behavior, his whole demeanor. Everything about him changed. He became excited and happy to be in the program and hang out with his friends and all of these different things. And I just want to say, when we allow grace and mercy to cover our homes, it doesn't cause permanent damage. Imagine if we didn't do that. He would just go yet to maybe another program or go back home, or go deeper into sin and other issues. But these, these things actually stayed with him. His parents were like, I don't know what you did to him, but he's completely different. I don't know what you did, but something about him is different. And I even had a conversation with the parents, too. It's like, I told them exactly what happened and how we handled it. And, and, and I have to believe that it, that it made an impact there as well. And so I just want to encourage us with that thought. These thoughts. Make Christ the foundation of your home. Let love and honor be the framework. Let there be windows of vision in your household giving purpose. Decorate your house with joy and cover your home in grace and mercy. When we do this, we build a godly home. We build an environment that raises up children, that serve the Lord, and that that we teach our children, we train their, their ways while they're young so that they don't depart from the truth, right, when they're older. I want us to rise up to our feet real quick. Because all of us, we have different experiences. Uh, We have all different experiences in our life and how we grew up, how we viewed discipline, how we viewed uh, love in the home. And whatever traditions you develop in your house, that's great. Each of us will have our own traditions. But let our house be built on a firm foundation.
Amen. I want us to pray and just lift your hands because all of us have family in here. Whether we are the child or whether we're the parent, I want us to raise our hand and begin to pray for our home, that God would be at the center, that God would be in the aspect of everything that we do, that love and honor would be the, the framework, and, and that really grace and mercy would cover us. So just begin, I want you to lift your voice right now with me and begin to pray. Begin to pray for your family. Begin to pray for your parents. Pa parents, begin to pray for your children. Begin to pray that God would have his way in the the home and then it would be evident so Lord Jesus right now I pray for every family I pray for every home God that might even be in division that might even be in a place where it's just it's not a healthy environment Lord that you would begin to bring a turning tide that you would begin to shift God our hearts in your direction that you would change our actions our routines Lord that you would meet us first Lord with grace and mercy and through your grace and mercy God let it be the agent that changes our homes let it be the agent Lord that brings transformation that removes any damage underneath the floorboards that's been done. I pray, God, that there would be mercy, that there would be grace, that there would be honor and love, Lord, in our homes. In Jesus' mighty name.